good evening, Erev Tov, Shalom Aleichem to everybody, and um, this um, podcast, again, thanks to Rabbi Saul Yudkowsky and the J Foundations, we want to give a big shout out to them, and um, we, um, I'm wearing a scarf today because uh, we're, we had a snow day today here in Yerushalayim, in Kodesh, I'm sure everyone must have heard about it, and it was a big thing, and here in Israel, we don't get snow as often as you get in the States. And uh, it was a school day off, and there was no, no buses, and, uh, and the island was enjoying themselves in the snow. As I said this morning in Davening, Kashelag Yalbinu, and we said, Kfor Ka'efe Yafazir, Mashta Karch Chafidim, Thank you, Rasa Miyabag, you see the Rabbanisums, great Kayach, Mamish, changes the whole landscape when you see the snow, especially in Yushalayim, the mountains. Yushalayim Harim Savivla. And uh, there's a certain newness, certain freshness to, um, to snow that we love, to, we love to, to see because it really, it represents, it represents uh, white tahira. And that's really what we're looking for. And I thought that it was maybe a little bit of an appropriate way to segue into the topic we want to talk about in tonight's, in tonight's Zoom Shmooz which is a new series which we're starting. Uh, uh, really, the series is all about Gedolim, and uh, particularly tonight we want to speak a little bit about Rebbe Le'ezer Shach, Zeich Hatzadik Mavrach, the great Rosh Hashiva from Panovich, or as, as he was known, Rebbe Le'ezer Menachem Man Shach, that was his name, and uh, the, the author of the, Avi, of the Avi Ezri's, which was his... Uh, Tremendous safe which he wrote in the Rambam. And before we speak about my own personal recollections, and I, a lot of the things are stories that I did write in the book. So if you're familiar with the book, then you might know some of the stories. But we always, there's always a place to add on new information. But I just think it's worthwhile when we speak about Gedolim just to get a sense of, you know, what does it mean to be a Gadol? What does that mean to be a gadol? Now, just the word gadol itself, what's the translation of the word gadol? Uh, simple understanding, gadol means he's a gadol. What does a gadol mean? He, he's an older person. Like we know in the language of Chazal, gadol means there's a cotton and then there's a gadol. So what does that mean? You know, it becomes bar mitzvah. You become bar mitzvah, you're a gadol. And you're a the mitzvahs. We always like to say over the pshat, what the, what the, what the, what the, um, what Megillah, what it says in the end of Megillah's Esther, that Mordechai Yehudi was Gadol la Yehudim. What does it mean, Gadol la Yehudim? Gadol is like the, the, the attribute of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. A Kaddish Baruch Hu is a Kel ha Gadol ha Gibar Vandera. A Gadol is someone that does for others. That's the difference between a Katan and a Gadol. A Katan can't be involved with making a minion. He can't be part of the community. He can't be part of the Tzibur because he's a Katan. A Katan is someone that receives. A gadol is someone doesn't only receive, but he returns, he gives to others. And that was the pshat by Mordechai. Mordechai says, Ki gadol Yehudim, bechov. He always gave to the Jewish people, always concerned about the Jewish people. So if I would try to give like a, a headline to what a gadol, and really this is true from all the gadolim, but specifically we want to speak about Rav Shach tonight, is really the great, great, attribute of caring about the tzibur and the responsibility of what it means to care about Kla Yisrael. And I met many, many gedolim, and each one was, was a giant. In a certain area, Rav Shach was really beyond all the other ones. Rav Shach, not only was he great in Torah, which is definitely a you know, a mainstay. You can't be a gadol unless you're great in Torah. He was great in Torah, great in Chesed. But more importantly, his responsibility for the Klal Yisrael, responsibility for the, for the really for the overwhelmingly populations. He took care of not only Eretz Yisrael, the Olam Yeshivas, which which that was really his main function, but he cared about all B'nai Torah in Russia, in 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 the. The Ukraine, now the Ukraine is very, very popular and what's going on in the Ukraine. And uh, Europe, Africa, and North America as well. South America, but North America, he didn't have to get so involved because Baruch Hashem, North America was blessed with many, many gedolim. 
So he always never would mix in unless he was asked to give a day, but normally he would never mix into it. But Rav Shach really had a great, great capacity of just, he cared about every single aspect of, 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 of clients, whoever they are. And sometimes, you know, like a person, you have great people. You know, Rosh Hashiva, he's involved with his yeshiva. You have a great Rav, he's involved with his community. But when you have a person that's involved not only with his yeshiva, not only with his community, not only with his city, but as a world person, a person that's worried, cares about what's going on with the Jewish people in the world. That's a true gadol. That's a true mida of a Kaddish Baruch Kel HaGadol, always caring about. And I think Rav Shach really depicted this. Right before I started the podcast, and I just listened, someone put out a little video about um, the Vat Hatzala in, um, during World War II, which was founded by the Gedolim in order to help the people during the Holocaust and they, they spoke about Mr. Mr. Irving Bunim, who was a balabas in America. That is a great, great story, which I want to mention, even though it's not about Rav Shach, but it's the type of story that you could hear about Rav Shach also doing. It's, it's a great story. So I heard this over from, and they have it in the video. You can get it. Mr. Amos Bunim, Zichron of Rocha, the son of, of Irving Bunim. I happened to have a relationship. I remember Amos, he once came to Neriakov a few times to speak when his grands, one of his grandchildren was in the Yeshiva Akiva Glick. And uh, he was just a wonderful person. And he had a tremendous, tremendous love for his father, who was a giant. And he t- helped Reb Aaron Cutler, Zechot Tzadik Levrach, the great God. He was like a big believer in Reb Aaron. But I heard this, this story. It's like an amazing story. There was one of the Rosh Hashivas in Eretz Yisrael in the 1930s, late 1930s. His name was Rabbi Farber. And he had a yeshiva called Hechel Atam, but he somehow was able to get away from Europe. And he was in Eretz Yisrael, Palestine. He came to America to raise money for the Hechel Atam the yeshiva. And uh, he ended up trying to get out his family, who were then in Eastern Europe, to get them to get, to get visas to go to Eretz Yisrael to save them, because they saw what was going on. He had the vision to see that a war is about to start, and who knows what's going to happen. So he had to get uh, visas from two different places. One was from the British government, who were great, great lovers of the Jewish people, as we always know. Yeah, they were so interested in helping Jews. That was one thing he had to do. And then he had to get it from the Jewish agency. Now, what he needed was to show that he wasn't just a burden on the community in Palestine. Because uh, we can't let people be a burden on the, on the community of Palestine. Who cares about what the Nazis are about to do? But um, in order to show that, he had to show that he has money. Now, he didn't have money. He was Rosh Hashiva. He was raising money to, to keep the yeshiva going. And he ended up meeting Mr. Irving Bunim. And Irving Bunim said to him, I think, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef, I'm going to give you $5,000 to put into your bank account. Okay. And uh, that shows that you're an established person. And this way you'll get a bank book. And you'll be able to get uh, the visas that you need. I'm going to give you not $5,000. I'm give you $5,039. She says, Irving, what do you need to give me? $5,000 is enough. He says, no, the thirty nine is because I want them to think that you've had this account and you're getting interest on the account. You shouldn't just think it's exactly $5,000. Because 5000 I think, was a certain amount that you needed to show. Anyway, he ended up going to the, to the British consulate in New York, and he showed him his bank account, his bank book. And uh, and the British, who who were not big uh, lovers of the Jewish people, they saw it, and said, oh, very good. You're an established person. We're going to give you a visa. But besides us, you have to get permission from the Jewish agency. Now, the Jewish agency was not a religious organization at all. It was a secular Zionist religious, uh, non-religious organization. They weren't so interested in religious people. And uh, he had a meeting with them. He went down to Manhattan and he met a Mr. So-and-so, and I can't remember the person's name right now, a Jewish man. And he showed him his, he said, I got like, a visa permission for the thing, I have to get permission from you. And then he looked at this bank book, and he, like a real typical year, he says, Rabbi Farber, where does a rabbi like you get $5,000? Yeah. yeah. What's going on over here? So he was honest. He said, I'll be honest with you, I don't have the money, but Mr. Irving Bunim, a very, very established uh, businessman, gave me the money. He loaned me the money, and it's put into the account. So they told him, we don't deal with hanky-panky things. Yeah? 
no, this is not legitimate. And they did not let him get, they did not give him a visa. So the Goyim, who are usually the sticklers, they, they, they gave him permission. But the Yidden, the Yidden who weren't really acting like Yidden, they didn't give him permission. So he was much distraught. He knew that this was it. So he went back to Mr. Irving Bunim and he told him exactly what happened. And Irving said, uh, oh, I have to think about it. The next day, the next day, he met with him. He says, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you like this. It's a very, very difficult thing. And it's a horrible thing what they did to me. And he said over his line, the Yidden don't do for other Yidden. It's the worst thing. So he said, but I'm going to have a meeting with three very, very important people who I do business with. One is the head of the Mizrahi party. One is the head of... Uh, another, I think, religious Zionist party, and another is the head of uh, some other Jewish organization. And they have a lot of clout with the Jewish agency because they support the Jewish agency. So he's, he had made a lunch meeting with him, and they had a lunch meeting in Manhattan, and uh, they asked him, no, Irving, you didn't call us here for a lunch meeting. What do you want? So he says, I'll tell you what exactly what I want. They told him the story, and, and he said, uh, you know, the British are giving him this Jewish agency. Like, I want you to call the British agency person. I want you to tell them, put pressure on him, that they have to give they have to give him a visa. So he said, "Oh, this is very very difficult for us to put pressure on the thing." So he says, "Okay, if you're not going to do it, I just want to tell you one thing. If you don't get me that passport, that visa, by tonight or tomorrow morning, came exactly what time it was. I'm going to go tomorrow morning in Manhattan to the." Um, offices of the um, of the Sachnut, the Jewish agency, and I'm going to take a big rock, and they have a big pane window, and I'm going to throw the rock through the window. I'm going to smash that window. So he said to him, Irving, you can't, it's against the law. What are you, what are you doing? You, you can't do a thing. He says, and what is that going to help? What is it going to help? You're going to get arrested. What's going to help? He says, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. The New York Times is going to come, and they're going to ask why Mr. Irving Buning is throwing a rock through the window. And I'm going to tell them it's because Jews do not help other Jews. When non-Jews help other Jews. And I'm going to tell them the story, and I'm going to spill the beans on them. So they said to him, you're really going to do this? So they said, I'm making a shvua. And he was a religious person. I'm making a shvua right now. That if you don't get me that thing, I'm going to go tomorrow morning, and I'm going to throw the rock through the window. Within three hours, he got a phone call from the Jewish agency. Your request has been... Has been. Everybody said, this is, a, this is a gadol. A gadol is someone that cares about... Passionately, passionately cares about the Jewish people. I was uh, as a yeshiva bacher, in the, when I came to learn in Eretz Yisrael a long, long time ago, yeah, over 40 years ago, and I was able to learn in the Mir Yeshiva by the great Gedolim, Reb Chaim Shalevitz and Reb Nochem Pritzovitz and, and Reb Benish Shetzal. And, uh, and I was able, I'd heard about Reb Shach many, many times before I came there. So I wanted to go see him. I wanted to hear him. And I traveled from Yushalayim to Bnei Brak when I heard there was a shmuz. I had a friend of mine that was learning in Panovich. And I heard Reb Shach was going to give a shmuz one night. And I took a a sherut, it was called in those days, from the top of Rechov Strauss. And I went to Bnei Brak, and I went in the middle of, at the beginning of second Seder, I got there early. And, uh, and then I was introduced, I saw that Reb David Pavarsky, Zetzal was then the, one of the, the other Rishiva, he was sitting in the base manager, sitting and learning a regular bacher. And I went over to him, and I introduced myself, because I was friendly with his nephew in Baltimore and his relatives and and then I, he said, where are you learning? And I said, I'm learning them here. And then I had a kasha on the sugi that I was learning. I started asking him, and Reb David was right into the sugi, even though they weren't learning that mesepta in Panovich, but they were learning in the mirror. But right away, we got into a whole risk of their isa, and he gave me a gavalik, a gavalik, a pshat, and the kasha that I had. That was Reb David. And then the seder was ending, and I thought for sure the shmuz was going to be in the base medrash. And then all of a sudden, I see everyone standing up, and they go to a side room. In Panovich, the minute was, you don't give the shmuz in the base medrash. The base manager was used for learning, and you go into the side room. And there, Rav Shach used to give his famous, his famous Musr talk. It was a very, very look, austere kind of room. Panovich was a little different, even the mirror, which was austere, but the Panovich looked even more austere. And uh, Rav Shach got up, and it was the first time I heard Rav Shach speak, and I saw the passion and the Musr that he gave, and the Adrocha gave, and just the way he looked. He looked, the only way I describe him, he looked like a Navi. 
He looked like a Navi. He gave Musa like a Navi, talked like a Navi, but you see that you saw the passion in him. And from that was the first time I was captivated in the audience to see Rav Shach. And then I heard him speak on a few occasions by Levias. By, he spoke when Rav Chaim Shmulevitz was Nifter. He spoke when Rav Moshe Feinstein was Nifter. Patzkal Abramsky, he spoke. And, um, and every single time I heard him, it was always like uplifting. He always came back with an uplifting, uplifting feeling. And uh, then what happened was, you know, I was a younger man in the mirror. I was a bacher, then I got married, a younger man in the mirror. And eventually I got a, a job teaching in an American yeshiva. And for some reason, I was a, either I was appointed or somehow it fell into my lap. I, used, I was like the first one to start doing the gedolim trip. In those days, we used to take the boys from the yeshiva, take them on a, certain occasions, take them to B'nai Brak, and then we would go visit the stipler, we would go visit Rav Shach, we would go visit Rav Dava Pavarsky, go visit Rav Michal Lefkovich. Later on, we, we went to Rav Aaron Leib Steinemann, and especially in Ner Yaakov, yeah, it was always a big highlight. Rabbi Michal, Rabbi Michal Feinstein we went to. Later on, we went to Yobal Chaim Tov, Rabbi, Rabbi Maisha Hill Hirsch. And, uh, and I used to take the boys, and Rav Shach would speak with them, and it was always just, it was just great. Yeah, and you saw the way he dealt with it, you, and the way he spoke to every single individual Bacha afterwards. And a Bacha would have a shy and give him, a, give him an insight right away. He cared about every single person. And um, then I was Zoycha when I um, I got involved with a little bit of a I'll describe it as a, a kahila type of issue, which Rav Shach was very much involved, and I was asked by Rav Yishvei Zatzal to go and speak to Rav Leizer Shach, and I ended up going to many many times. You saw yes before how many times I was by Rav Shach. We were there a few times. I was by many many times. And, um, and I saw the way he dealt with that particular klal issue with such insight and with such achrayas. It's the only way to describe achrayas. He had tremendous, tremendous achrayas and tremendous insight. And, uh, and I became very, very close to him. And then eventually, when I uh, decided to open up Ner Yaakov, I uh, discussed it with him and he gave me his bracha and gave me his advice. And he even told me, and I read in the book, that he said that um, that um, he he um, he's going to be the nasi of the yeshiva. He's going to be the president of the yeshiva. He appointed himself. He's going to be the president of the yeshiva because <laughs> he felt that that would help me. And also, when he had involvement with the yeshiva, it always had siyat deshmaya. That's the way it was. He didn't tell me that, but then I I saw that afterwards how much siyat deshmaya had. Now, it wasn't just only the siyat deshmaya, which was the main thing, but it was just the care. Anytime I had a shayla, I had a different question that came up, you could always go to Rav Shach, have a go to be able to go speak to him. It was tremendous. Take the bochum to him. They got chizik from him. So it was really a, 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 just beyond. So I want to say over one story that took place, and uh, it took place in 1991, 1991, for those of you who might remember a piece of history, um, the, uh, the world was then, um, everyone thinks that now the world's not such a safe place. You know, we have what's going on now, Russia, uh, if you're following the news, Russia, Ukraine, China, eh, everything that's going on, the truth is, it goes in cycles. So then the big issue was Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, uh, war number one. And uh, the point was is that he, he threatened um, to shoot missiles into Israel, 1991. Now, this was really going on for a, a period of time. It didn't just happen you know, overnight. It was going on for a period of time, and America said that they're going to they're gonna bomb him. And, but he threatened, he's going to shoot missiles into Israel. I don't know what the, what the shooting to missiles, what is he going to do with Israel? He, he, an anti-Semite, that's what he is, you know. Halachi, Esav Sonny Yaakov, Saddam Bavadai Sonny Yaakov, Kol Shekin. So I remember going to Rav Shach, and before this man even started, then he asked me, Shach, do I have a right to bring boys from America into a place which is a danger zone? They say that in those days we thought it was going to be chemical warfare. So we thought chemical, he's a threatening chemical warfare. In America, everyone said he had chemical warfare. In the end of the day, they found that he didn't have any chemical, he didn't have anything. Yeah, the whole thing was a big bluff. 
That's what they say. But at the time, it was a real threat. And if Shach told me then that... Uh, I want to read the exact lesson that I write over here in the book. Yeah, Rav Shach said that... No, for sure, the Talmud, that's what he says like this. He says... Do I, I write, yes, but I have a right, is, my, is responsible my part to bring American boys into a war zone. So he replied, first of all, nothing has happened yet. That was the first, nothing has happened yet. In Eretz there are always future threats to worry about. He said, you think there's a threat? Ah, there's more threats to worry about. And this I heard from other Gedolim as well. Like, you know, not to not take it seriously, but in Eretz Yisrael, that's the Mahalach. The Mahalach, there's always threats. Right now, it's a threat, but it's not more than a threat. And so first of all, he calmed me down about the political situation. You know, like I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, war is happening any minute, any minute. No. And then he said, for your type of Baruchim who come to your yeshiva, this was amazing. He says, a year in Eretz Yisrael can be categorized as pikuch nefesh, saving their lives. A regular Bachar living in America, he can go to Lakewood, he'll go to, you know, Muncie. It's not Pikuch Nefesh. But for you boys, it's a matter of life and death. If they don't come here, who knows what's going to happen. So you have a right to bring them, and you should definitely bring them. I would even call it a mitzvah on your part to make sure that they come here. So Rav Shach, he presented his opinion with his trademark decisiveness. And it was with these words that was able to enter into the year, into the Zman. And we therefore, what do you do? You, pay, you make you pay attention. You, know, you try not to pay attention to the news, even though it was constantly being talked about. And um, so first of all, just to me, it was a, he took a chrais, a big chrais. But you want to hear how far the chrais went? This is how far the chrais went. The Zman was progressing very nicely. We had guys learning. And the Iraqis gave an ultimatum. Either the Americans get out of Ku- Ku- Kuwait by a certain deadline, or we're going to bomb you back into the Stone Age. And I know America said that to, Ku- to, to, to Iraq. And Iraq said, no, we're going to send chemical missiles. And the deadline was set for mid January. January 15th was the deadline, I remember that. Right in the smack of the middle of the And I remember what happened was is that um, I remember the discussions were going on in the yeshiva. The back and forth, and we had parents that were calling. It wasn't easy. And uh, there was a nonstop deluge of phone calls from worried parents. One day my phone rang, and it's Rav Shach Sagabai. And he says to me, Rav Yeshua, this is, I'm calling from B'nai Iraq. What can I do for you, Rav I live? Rav Shach wanted me to tell you that the conversation that we had earlier in the year applies even now. Do you hear this? Do you hear the concern of Obama? He had a conversation with me four or five months before that. He remembered the conversation. He remember who he spoke to? Maybe, I, and I don't know if I was the only one that he, that, that, he, that he spoke to about it. But call up Rabbi Yeshua. He's probably nervous. And tell him, you can still remain. And this made a tremendous difference to me. Because I was able to have the, 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 the chizuk, that what? That the God of Lador was saying, that, uh, ah, things are going to be all right. Things are going to be all right. And then I went, I went to visit him, and I asked him, what happens if a mother is calling me up, and she said she's afraid her son's going to be gassed by Saddam Hussein, like her grandparents who were killed in the gas chambers. <laughs> I had one parent that said that to me. What am I supposed to tell us? Rav Shach says, I've the mama vent, medaf shik and tzirik. If a mother's crying... Then you got to send them. A mother's crying, a mother's tears. That takes that. That's the trump card. That takes president of everything. But on the other hand, if you're able to inject the boys and their families with the chizuk to remain here, so that's the correct and safe path. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of boys, almost half the yeshiva. I would say almost fifty percent, a little less than fifty percent, around forty percent of the boys left because it was uh, it was up in the air. And uh, we'll tell a cute story in a second. And, um, but close to 60% of the boys stayed. And I have to tell you, the boys that stayed, that's man in Eretz Yisrael. Every single one of the boys that remained, 
they had a, experienced a tremendous aliyah that they got from being able to be in the yeshiva during that time. And I would say that they accomplished more in their first year than m- most Bochum ever did, even in two years. That's how much they accomplished. And we had to wear gas masks, and it was a whole thing. We had the classic story, the classic Nir Yaakov story, which was that, you know, in those days it was um, CNN would have these reportings, and w- when the missiles would go off in Iraq, CNN was wearing that missile went off, and suppose you had like two to three minutes till it was going to land in Israel. So some parents would be on the phone. Oh, they were watching it. They're saying, oh, they would call up. Oh, the missile's firing. And we had gas masks. And we had sealed rooms and everything. I remember the whole sealed room thing. And um, so now the truth is it went on for a while. And it was pretty, it wasn't easy, you know, living in such a thing. I moved into the yeshiva. A uh, whole story about Exactly when I came back to Eretzro, I was in America, came back, moved into Yeshiva for a few weeks just to be with the boys all the night. I wasn't even home. Yeah, I stayed in the Yeshiva the whole time because the sirens can go off at any time. Anyway, after a while, you know, you know, these guys, you know, you know, guys are, you know, they have to have a good time. So one day they, they recorded s- uh, sirens going off and they made a, one guy made a phone call to his mother and he says, Mom, you know, how's everything, this and that. And all of a sudden, he would play the recording. Mom, I got to get off. The, the, the siren's going off. The siren's going off. And all of a sudden, he would do it on the phone. Oh, they're shooting, Mama. They're shooting. His mother was having a heart attack on the phone. Oh, Mom, it was just a practical joke. I didn't really mean it. <laughs> didn't really mean it. When I heard about it from the mother's complaint, this and that, I said, I didn't tell him to do it, Mrs. So-and-so. <laughs> but... To, to go back to the, the, that point, ah, when Rav Shach said something, and I think this is such a great thing, Rav Shach, he was like the Urim Vatumim. Your mom has felt it was the Urim Vatumim. And this came into play almost 10 years later when there was the tremendous uh, uh, terrorist attack in Israel when the Subaru restaurant was attacked. I don't know if you I can't remember if it was 2001 or 2003. I can't remember exactly. But um, that, was, um, that was also a, a, a story. And I think we're going to leave that story for the next time. Okay? I think we'll leave that story for the next time. I want to just end off with, um, you know, this if part one of Rav Shach. That's you know, pretty good. Uh, some interesting stories. You know, we started off with the Nusra Wasm Nef Shach, but it gives a little perspective what a Godel is. And now we kind of put it into, um, to bring a little bit home what Rav Shach was all about and his caring for everybody. But uh, in this week's parasha, we have parashas Mishpatim. And I just saw a vart from the, from the Lekach Valiba from Avram Shur, Negea to the, the Gemara, the, the Rashi brings down, Eile Mishpatim Shetosin Lifneim, that Moshe Rabbeinu, why is it Lifneim? So it wants to tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu said, oh, maybe I'll just teach Klai the halachas once or twice or three times. They'll know exactly what they have to do. I don't have to go to Be'iyan into everything. I don't have to go to Be'iyan. So if says, you're not going to go, you know, you have to teach them, it's going to be like a shulchan aruch lefanav. You have to tell them the whole pshat. You have to tell them everything that's going on. And Lekech Valibav has a whole to show us that when Chazal say something, for instance, the halacha is, you're not supposed to learn by the light of a candle on Shabbos. Why? Shemayate. Because you might come to what? To, you might come to, to, to turn it, to try to, to dip it, to turn it towards you. Shemayate. The candle's going to start going out, you're going to try to fix it up. And the Gemara says that the, uh, one of the Amorayim said, uh, uh, one of the Tanoim said, Oh, you know, I, uh, I think it was Abshim Ba Yechai said, uh, you know, I, I said, I'm not, it's not going to happen to me. I know the halacha. <coughs> and then Kemat, it almost happened to me. So the word is, is that when Chazal says something, this is what the Sfat Semah says, it creates a mitzias. It creates, it's, 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 it's a reality in the world. When Chazal says Shemayate, so even the greatest Tanoim, they also could be nechshah. Because Chazal, they create a definition. 
And this is a lesson in the Mishpatim, that when, Klau, when, when, when Chazal say this is a halacha is like this, that becomes the definition. The great Gedolim, they have the ability, they create a definition. They create a mitzvah in the world. And when Rav Shach said, this can happen, uh, to me it felt like the Urim Vatumim. And uh, we saw clearly the Siyat HaDashma in the end of the day, Baruch Hashem, everyone was safe. 39 missiles were then fired into Eretz Yisrael. And not one of them uh, was gas. And supposedly only one person was nifter from the third. And he always said, Rav Shach always said then, Tehillim neged Tehillim. Tehillim, the best end is Tehillim. And they all say that Rav Shaim Kanievsky said and the Bnei Brak, and uh, that there won't be anything that will happen over there because there's Avtocha from the Chazanish. Again, these are the, the, greatness, the greatness of the Gedalim. So episode number one, on uh, Erev Shabbos, we're going into Shabbos Mavarchim. This Shabbos is going to be others coming in, other Rishon, Misha Nechlan Zadam Marv Mesimcha. We had a little bit of Simcha today in the snow. We're wishing everyone a good Shabbos. Everyone should be safe and sound. And Mitz Hashem, we should be Zaycha to Yeshua and the Chamas. Zaycha Mitz Hashem to the Gula Shleim and Herav Yemenu Amen. Thank you very much for listening. We want to thank jfoundations.com. If you could sponsor any of our activities, it'd be another way of addressing and being able to give over Torah to other people. Go on the website and show your support. Thank you very much for joining us.